Hello, church. Welcome to part five. And it's very, very important because we've set this up and we are unwrapping this onion one layer at a time that you, you catch up, that you don't jump in in the middle of this series. It's an 11 part series. And I know that's a long series, but we have a lot of work to do when we think about the strange and wonderful world of scripture and how to read and use our Bibles and even what our Bibles are and why they were written and how they can be properly used. How to, as Paul would put it, rightly divide or handle correctly the word of truth. So please make sure that you're caught up. We're going to introduce a, a new concept near the end of today that is new probably to you and to most people, but it is not a new concept to most biblical scholars. I believe uh, all of them know the concept, but that doesn't mean that it translates and it gets through to the congregations. Are we ready? I think we're ready. We've already seen that the Bible is full of arguments that they're, for example, for slavery. Uh, slavery here, not here. Genocide here. Peace here. There seems to be confusion woven throughout our stories. And to deny that means that we have to then go and act like we have answers to all of these things. And it, it becomes so convoluted. I can remember when I was a boy seeing a multi-volume book in my dad's library that were um, you know, alleged contradictions of the Bible explained. And this was written a very long time ago. These books were written a very long time ago. But my concern even at that time was, why do we have to have that many books to explain away things in the Bible? Why don't we just take what the Bible says and then understand it in its context? And that's what we're doing here. The good news is that after all of these arguments, God revealed himself completely to us through the person of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, his son. And that settles the arguments about who God is. And the book of Hebrews, one of my favorite books, absolutely pounds that point home that all of the things said about God are not from God, but rather God is what Jesus looks like, acts like, sounds like. And that's, that's a relief. I think the whole universe can let out a collectively held breath at that point and say, now we understand who God is and what he thinks of us. We go from 611 or so laws in the Old Testament to just a few laws when Jesus comes. Love God, love your neighbor, uh, to serve others, the Matthew 25 judgment scene, you know, love others, you know, clothe them, feed them, take care of them, worship God in spirit and in truth. These are not heavy, hard laws. These are nothing like the 611 laws that were in the Old Testament. It is not that God is applying a corrective here, that the Old Testament is wrong, bad, that those people made errors. No, not at all. It is that we needed all of that to bring us to Christ. More on that later. Interesting that even though God gave us so few laws through Christ that we tend to argue and divide and argue and divide again and again and again over things that he did not feel it important enough to regulate, to put the laws out there for us. For example, you know, how often do we take the Lord's Supper? And even that, the word take is interesting as if it was a preventive vitamin to make sure God loves us until the next time we take it. Instead of having a supper, I don't go take supper when I go to somebody's home. We have supper. But even that, we argue about when, how, and where to take it. We will argue about church governance, marriage and divorce, how old a leader should be, uh, whether they should have children, how many children, how old is too old and we go on and we go on how about whether worship should be sermon centered uh song centered and pray centered or lord's supper centered there are fights about this one i've had people talk to me uh some time ago saying that our safe harbor would never be uh, really successful unless it is almost entirely praise centered well we don't have that many people at the sound stage and if you can play an instrument and sing a song in the Nashville area, you probably have a gig on Sundays. So they were really just telling us we were out of luck and this was not going to work unless they came in and brought their praise teams with them. And I was going, 
I don't think so. But we have these opinions, don't we? And sometimes we, we, once we have an opinion, we go to the Bible and try to force that, force that opinion into the scripture. That's called scholasticism, and it happens far more often than you might think. The problem is if you address, approach rather, the Bible as a book of laws, that doesn't solve your problem. It absolutely creates a problem. If it's a book of laws directly given by God, no other intermediaries write to the mind of the human that they are to write down the very words of God and nothing else, no humanity, only the words of God, then you have to decide which of these laws do you follow, which applies to you. Do the slave laws in Exodus 21 apply to you or the slave laws in Deuteronomy 15 or the no slave laws in Galatians and Philemon? You have to also decide which laws were really just directives about a local cultural issue, a, a, a particular place at a particular time, a particular situation, and which laws were meant to cover all believers in all cultures, in all times, and in all situations. That's why we have over 400 faith families within just the Protestant churches and as some have tried to then delineate them and say that there are nearly 40,000 Christian denominations, that's a bit of a stretch, frankly. But you get the point. We do that because we cannot sit and agree upon which of these laws is which and where it applies. So we're going to take a particular question and make a case study over the next six weeks. It is one which, for many of you, is not controversial at all but for two different reasons. And that is, what are the roles of women in the church? Some of you, it's not a controversy at all. They have no role that's public speaking. Others, it's no controversy at all. They can be ministers. They can be pastors. They can be elders. They can be very different groups have come to absolutely firm conclusions. And then there are a lot of people in the muddy middle who think, well, I think it's supposed to be this way. What, how do we deal with it? So we're going to use a case study. And we're going to use that one. What can women do in the new kingdom? The church, God's kingdom on earth. The Bible is our story. So we take it seriously. It brought us to Jesus. So we owe it everything. But we do not owe it our worship. I've always found it strange that in some churches in which I've been, there are songs of praise to the Bible. Or about the Bible, give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wonder alone and tempest tossed. Okay, but why are we in a time of worship singing about the Bible rather than about the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? It's of interest to me. I'm not saying it's sinful, but it does seem to be a bit strange. We're allowed to examine our Bibles. We're allowed to question it. We're allowed to search for answers. God likes that. The Bereans were considered more noble because they examined these things to see if what was being taught was true. Paul didn't say just take it and believe it. He said, handle it correctly. Rightly divide it. When we start talking about women and their place in the church, two passages are thrown immediately at us. In fact, I'm known for being very egalitarian, which means that, in my opinion, women can do whatever men can do in the church. And because of that, I've received an awful lot of hate mail over the years, uh, an awful lot of calls for debate and phone calls that were pretty harsh. I can still remember the guy that didn't believe anything I said to the point where when he called my house and my wife answered, he said, is this Patrick Mead's so-called wife? I mean, there's a, there's a guy who's consistent, I'll give you that. But I get a lot of, and a lot of them say, you need to read 1 Timothy chapter 2 and, and verse 11 and 12, or you need to read 1 Corinthians 14, 34, as if I haven't. I have, I'll do it now. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. It's in a very strange break, by the way. Uh, the Bible was not originally divided by chapters, verses, or paragraphs. In fact, there weren't even punctuation marks to notice uh, for you to say that's the end of this sentence. 
in some versions of the Bible, some printings of the Bible rather, this is a whole brand new paragraph, verse 34. Others take part of verse 33 and put it with 34. It's really, you know, where you put the dots and the paragraph breaks really does change things. But since people say 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35, why don't we just read that? Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Wow. Sounds rather cut and dried, does it not? And I can understand why people, if that's what they've read, and that's all they've read, say, okay, we get it. Well, we won't comment more on that today, but we're going to comment a lot on it the next few weeks. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Okay. Well, there are people that say that's it then. I found these three verses, these four verses rather, since we added verse 35 in, in 1 Corinthians 14. The Bible said it. I believe it. That settles it. But that's really helicoptering in. You're helicoptering into a strange culture, a different time, a different language, and you are only reading part of a person's mail. The book of Corinthians, for example, is probably 2 Corinthians because he refers to an earlier letter we don't have. And 2 Corinthians refers to a letter of wrath, an angry letter that we do not have. So how many letters were there to the Corinthians? We do not know. We just have two. It's interesting, whenever I would bring that up, people would say, but well, God made sure we had the ones we wanted. And I'll look at him and I'll say, say um, that's taken completely on faith because nothing in scripture tells you to believe that. You're reading part of a, a person's mail and only one side. You're not getting the response. So what was going on in Corinth? What was Paul talking about? How did this text come about? Instead of just then helicoptering from Corinth to a very different place, Ephesus, and grabbing a couple of verses out of chapter 2 while ignoring the rest of chapter 2. We're going to talk about that in some detail in a future sermon. The fact is, Corinth was a mess as a city and as a congregation. There was a Roman expression that if you were out of line, that if you were completely uncivilized in your behavior, that you were acting like a Corinthian. And if you read 1 Corinthians, you can see why. It is a mess. None of us would go to that church. None of us watching here would go more than once. Once we saw it, we would have backed out of it. Which I find cool that Paul, knowing all of this, still calls them brothers, co-laborers, co-workers in the Lord, and saints. But regardless, that unruly mob of Corinth, then you go to Ephesus. Ephesus was full of faithful Christians where the church was, but the city was dedicated to the worship of a goddess named Diana or otherwise known as Artemis, which was a female name at the time. So they were outnumbered by the goddess worshipers by a lot. If we limit ourselves to these passages, we would assume that God has created man to do some jobs in the church and women to do some jobs um, other jobs, lesser jobs, unpublic jobs. The fact is that God did create men and women differently. And although government and all those social pressure and social media will attack you for saying so, men are men and women are women. And we are men or women to the cellular level, period. Men have some differences from women. Women have differences from men. Every human being that has ever been born has been ushered onto the planet by a woman. Period. Not somebody who thinks they are or this, that. No. It takes a woman. Men are generally, with many exceptions, stronger, more capable athletically or militarily than women. In fact, uh, the women's national soccer team in America played a game against a high school boys team in Texas and got shellacked. 
And we're seeing again and again the eraser, erasure of women by men joining women's sports teams and then blowing out all of the records. And that's a tragedy because women are precious and wonderful and fantastic and intelligent and wise and we need women and they need their safe places. But our physical differences, does that, do they make women incapable of public leadership in the kingdom of God, the community of faith? If you only read these two verses, your answer is already Yes, absolutely, God said. But if you read the entire Bible, the answer is no. Here, we see Miriam leading worship after the crossing of the Red Sea. We see Huldah, called a prophet, validating the reforms of King Josiah. For the entire nation, a woman prophet validated this. Deborah was a nation's judge and military leader, both religious and secular leader of Israel. In Micah chapter 6 and verse 4, Deborah is named right alongside of Moses as leaders of Israel. There's an unnamed woman who saved Joab from a siege he had foolishly launched against Abel Beth Macha in 2 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 22. And then there's Abigail, who David said God had sent, quoting a wise and prudent woman to stop David from making a foolish and violent mistake. God sent a woman with that message. Or when Joab got in trouble again, Joab often did, God sent a woman called Tekoa to help him negotiate himself out of it in 2 Samuel chapter 14. It was a woman who saved Moses' life and served as his nurse and teacher. In Psalm 68, 11, we see God picking women as the announcers of his kingdom and his word among the people. Throughout Proverbs, wisdom is anthropomorphized as a woman, consistently as a woman. When Jesus is born, he's taken to the temple where two people recognize him. One, Simeon, is an older priest who is there on that day. The other and a prophet, not prophetess, that's a fake word. We don't put S on the end. A prophet who lives at the temple. Women were everywhere. And after Jesus, yeah, Philip had four daughters, Acts chapter 21 and verse 9, who preached alongside him. Don't do the gymnastics that one fellow did to me when I brought this up. He goes, but they only taught women. And I said, what? They preached alongside him. How do you, well, because he had to make it conform to one verse in 1 Corinthians 14 and one verse, or two verses in 1 Timothy chapter 2. <sighs> there, we'll talk more about that. We see Priscilla, all, also known as Prisca, in a teaching role, almost always mentioned before her husband, in a society where who's mentioned first tells you who is taking the lead. When they're first mentioned, it's Aquila and Priscilla. From then on, it's Priscilla and Aquila. Even when they go teach a minister, she is mentioned first. Don't skip over that. To us, that's not much of a thing, but to them, it was a huge, important announcement of who took the lead. We see Dorcas, also known as Tapitha, who when she died, the church went into a tailspin. And this death spiral that they were in could only be saved if Dorcas came back. And so Peter raises her from the dead to help the church continue to function. When Paul wrote his book to the church at Rome, <coughs> excuse me, he closed that out with mentions of different people who had helped the kingdom move forward. Over two dozen people are named in Romans 16. Eight of them are women. But if you look to see who he gives credit for the success of his ministry, seven women and five men get the bulk of the credit. You also, in chapter 16, see Phoebe, a deacon. Not a deaconess, a deacon. In fact, Phoebe is the only person expressly called a deacon in Scripture. I know, everybody thinks Stephen. And Stephen probably was, but he was never named as a deacon in Scripture. Phoebe was. 
Phoebe was also given the task of taking the book of Romans and carrying it. Now, back then, by the way, people, it would have cost, in today's money, thousands and thousands of dollars to have written that manuscript because papyrus was expensive, rare, precious. And once you wrote it, you entrusted it only to the most trustworthy individual to carry it somewhere. But the words given to Phoebe mean more than just the carrier of the book. It means she was the reader of the book. The first people who heard the book of Romans heard it from the mouth of a woman named Phoebe. That's impressive. It's also instructive. And we should draw a line under that. And then we see Junia, about whom much later, she's referred to as highly esteemed among the apostles. Early Christian writers, by the way, in their letters and in the sermons that have survived, almost universally considered Junia not only as an apostle, but as one of the highest and best regarded apostles. Later, by the way, over a millennia and a half later, some men would try very hard to remove Junia from the text. We'll call, talk about that too. But the fact is, Junia is highlighted by Paul and the early church people highlighted her as well. We see women in Jesus' life and ministry from day one. In Luke 8, verses 1 through 3, a large number of women accompanied Jesus and the disciples, walking with them, helping support them, uh, funding it. By the way, I've got to say, our safe harbor has a lot of faithful women who fund this ministry. They're not wealthy. The money can come in in tens and twenties. But the fact is, we would not survive without faithful women supporting this ministry. That's amazing. But they also did this with Christ. Uh, and, and Luke mentions them for it. He saves, Jesus saves his highest compliments. He doesn't give a lot of compliments, but when he does, they're almost entirely to women and they're given in public. Now in psychology, oh, we call that a super compliment because a super compliment is one that's not given to a person in private, but one given to a person in the presence of others. It has a bigger meaning. Jesus did that in a society where men did not talk to women in public, they did not react to women in public, and they absolutely did not praise them in public, but Jesus did. When churches met, they met in homes. There weren't church buildings for hundreds of years. Some of them would meet in synagogues, which had buildings at the time, but there were not purpose-made Christian churches for quite some time. But when they met in homes, most of the time, the home is said to be the home of, and it's a woman. It's John Mark's mother. It's Mary. It's Martha. You get the point. Now, believe it or not, there are dozens and dozens more that we could, we could talk about. More women who held leadership, teaching, prophetic roles in the Bible. But we've been trained to skip over them because there are two verses out there in Corinthians and Timothy. We have all been tempted and told, relegate all that to the past because now a new covenant has arisen to silence women. Really? Is that what Jesus came to do? Is that what Jesus wanted? He came to redeem all of us but to keep the women quiet? Then what do we do when we roll up on strange passages like 1 Corinthians and Timothy? What do we do with all these other women who are active in the Old and New Testaments? Do we assume that all of the ones in the Old Testament, God didn't really care, that he didn't like that much, and those in the New Testament were in error? What do we do with it? So let me use a metaphor which is very, very important. Stories and faith and life itself are a river. The general flow is seen, it's understood, it's felt, but from time to time, you come upon a rock or a small eddy or a small stagnant pool off to the side. You acknowledge the irregularities. You notice them. You may even study them and make sure they're placed upon your navigational charts. 
but you can see the river flowing on. The river is the thing. And so you stick to the river. We also do not take two or three verses written at different times, at different places, to try to make them and all other passages agree with each other. Because that's not how the Bible was written. It isn't the Bible we have. We talked last week about the argument between Deuteronomy and Job. It's a pretty serious argument. We could also easily talk about the argument between the books of Samuel and Kings and the books of Chronicles. They don't tell the same story. But the term I want to introduce you to as we wrap up today is a term which is known by every scholar of Scripture and every well, scholar of ancient languages and ancient cultures, but also by, I believe, every theologian. And that word is multivocality. Multivocality means many voices. The Bible is not univocal, which we would expect if the way we got it was God spoke directly to humans who just wrote what they were told to write rather than inject their humanity, their culture, and their interpretations into what God was inspiring them to write. If God spoke it, men wrote it, we believe it, that's univocal. But as we've seen already, this, we're multivocal. We have different voices on slavery, different voices on genocide and peace, different voices on whether you can marry somebody who's not, uh, not a part of your, I hate to use the term race, but let's just say that if you're a Jew, you have to marry Jew. What happens if you marry a Gentile? Ezra and Amos would be in great arguments about that. They're, they're a multi-vocal book. The Bible does not speak with one voice. We've shown it, but we're also going to show it again. We are to examine, study, and here's the phrase again, handle correctly or rightly divide Scripture, seeking the voice of God as revealed in our story, but mainly as revealed in the person of Jesus, his son. And as we do so, this may take us closer to Jesus, but it will also take us away from our comfort zones. Some of you here at this part in verse, uh, part five are already easing out of comfort zones and you're a little bit scared. I get it. I, I had to make that journey too. I went from univocal, God said it, men were mere secretaries, to where I am today, not because of culture, not because of liberalism and progressivism and me wanting to be liked and well, you know, check, weigh the email and see. No, I got that there because I wanted to deal honestly with the book that we have and with the God that we have. And I found something out. It will bring you closer to Jesus. It'll bring you closer to peace. It may discomfort you for a while, but great comfort awaits those who can lay aside their false idols and hold on to Christ. Part six is next week. If you follow the Monday morning messages, I'm going to do short versions of each of these parts, but they follow about a month after the sermons. So you can go back and review by listening to the Monday morning messages, but then come back and make sure you've got all the scriptures and the entire flow. But between now and then, remember to sing your praises to Jesus, to follow Jesus, and to keep your eyes on Jesus. Go in peace.